Hi guys, it's Scott here and in today's video we're going to introduce you to dimensioning and take a look at the different dimensioning styles that you should be using. Before we get into that, let's just revisit our engineering problems overview. We've learned how to identify the real objectives to our problems as part of the office process. Step two was locating and creating viable options, which we did via a morphology method that we taught you. Step three had us selecting the best concept. So for that, we taught a composite criterion method, which is quite commonly used. For the moment, we're going to skip over the development of detailed solutions. That's something that we're going to be doing uh, later in the semester and also as a part of the Warman project. So that's still to come. And for now, we're going to get started on teaching you techniques to communicate your solutions to engineers and the general public. And to do that, we're going to teach you very important skills in how to create engineering drawings. Up until this point, we've taught you how to create isometric sketches and how to generate orthogonal views of the objects that you're trying to communicate to other people. In this stage, we're going to start putting dimensions on these, and this is where they start to become formal engineering drawings. So in the prior videos, we've taught you how to represent the geometry of an object in orthogonal views. And in these videos, we're going to explain how to go about correctly dimensioning them. So these dimensioning conventions are covered in chapters 11 and 12 of your engineering drawing handbook. And basically dimensioning refers to how we go about giving lengths and angles to our geometry to, to properly define it. The standard that we're actually drawing to is called Australian Standard 1100, and this contains a whole lot of rules for dimensioning and shortcuts that will hopefully make our task easier and quicker, as you'll see throughout this series of videos. And the engineering drawing handbook that you should have provides a summary of the AS 1100 with some additional advice on how to construct engineering drawings. It's basically a how-to guide as to how to use this standard um, to create these drawings. So let's take a look at the different dimensioning styles. There's a particular way that we need to represent dimensions on the drawing and we'll explain that. And there are also certain conventions that we follow in how we locate the dimensions on our drawing relative to the object that we're dimensioning. The first rule that we should explain is that the dimensions on our drawings should only be shown where they are true dimensions. And that means that basically we're dimensioning uh, a true length on the drawing and it's not shown sloping away from us uh, in a foreshortened kind of view. This means that we basically want to ensure that our object is squared up to us and is parallel and perpendicular in the planes that we're presenting and that we look at our object and we pick off all of the right angles that we can and we make sure that these are aligned with uh, the horizontal and the vertical of our drawing page before we start. Then if we put our dimensions on, we should be able to put a ruler across these dimensions and it should measure the true dimension if it's drawn to scale or the scale size if it's drawn to a different scale. So let's put a dimension on this drawing and look at an example. So say we take uh, this dimension here and it's 100 units, in this case we'll call them millimetres. Then if we go to a side view and the side view happens to be like this, then we're going to have a problem because we haven't actually dimensioned the true length of this edge between this corner and this corner. Uh, it may look like it's 100 millimetres in this view, but it's actually going to be slightly longer in this view. So that would be uh, something that we should avoid doing. So we haven't dimensioned the true shape, so let's avoid doing that. So we wouldn't do that if we had to we could dimension it in this view to clearly show that the distance between this edge here and this edge here is 100 projected, but the distance along uh, that edge there is not necessarily 100. So let's continue and let's assume that rather than on that strange angle, which we should avoid, that this object is actually flat and we've represented it correctly in our orthogonal projection and we've got some nice square angles. So this is a view that is now the true shape here of this face shown here and we can go about dimensioning this. So we might think okay let's go and dimension it and we might think to put a hundred millimeters dimension on here. Now if we actually have a think about it that dimension could be a little bit ambiguous. Does it mean that the distance from this corner to this corner is a hundred millimeters or does it mean that the vertical height from here to here is a hundred millimeters? 
if we transferred it over to the other view, it could be misinterpreted as meaning that this distance is 100 millimeters when in actual fact, it's measuring that distance there, which is slightly different. So in order to avoid confusion, we would probably, where possible, where we're given the option, we would avoid putting this particular dimension on that view because of the possibility for misrepresentation, and we'd move it across uh, to that other view there. So that would be the correct way of showing that 100 millimeters. So let's put another dimension on the drawing now, one that's correct, and let's have a talk about the style that's used for that dimension. So I've added a 100 millimeter dimension to represent this feature, um, the distance between this face here and this face here. So let's take a look at it in a little more detail. So first thing to note is that the dimension line that our dimension actually sits on is a type B line. So this is one of our half weighted, slightly lighter lines. We also have projection lines which go from the end of our arrowheads and project down towards the object so that we know what we're actually measuring. And this is also a half weight type B line. We make sure that we have uh, a little bit of a continuation of these projection lines past the arrowhead so that we can be sure that it is actually a projection line and it's not part of the object if we had a square corner there. So that makes sure that we recognize these easily um, on, our, on our drawing. Typically we try and stand off these dimensions at least 8 millimeters away from the object itself just so that we can have a clear view of the object without it being too clustered with um, dimensions and numbers very close to it. And we always have a small gap, generally a couple of millimeters between the object itself and the start of the projection line, again so that we can't confuse the projection line for part of the object. If we take a look at the arrowhead and the style of the arrowhead, typically we draw the heads about three to five millimeters long and with a width of about one to one and a half millimeters. So only a little bit wider than the line itself. Okay, let's take a look at this example and highlight an important point. So if we were to try and dimension the distance from this point here to this point here, the horizontal distance, as we've done here with 100, uh, we wouldn't do that by having arrows going diagonal like this. When we use dimensions, the dimension line itself, this is the distance that we're measuring uh, parallel to that line. So this wouldn't actually be 100 millimeters, that would be something more like 120 millimeters or 130 millimeters. So always make sure that this dimension line represents the actual dimension that is quoted and that you're not doing strange things on diagonals like this. So let's have a look at some of the other issues we may run into while we're dimensioning. I'm going to add a couple of dimensions down here. So we've got 80 and we've got another 80. So if you actually look at this from afar, you'll realize that there's potential ambiguity with how we've located these dimensions. This 80 line here is actually in line with some of the lines on the object. And so it could be confused for an edge on the object. So we try to avoid uh, putting our dimension lines in line with features of the object that are already there. Also, this other 80 here is kind of overlapping uh, our center lines for our holes. And so it's a little bit hard to see. So again, that could be misread as, as a feature or a slit in there. So we'll avoid doing that. So don't align your dimension lines with other types of lines. Rather than do this, a better way is to stand off the dimension using our projection lines like we've been shown so that we can clearly see that this is a dimension here and it's not part of the object. Another option for us here would be to put this dimension inside. And so this way we don't need to use additional projection lines. That's also an option. So either of these would be acceptable. Let's have a think about what happens if we're going to add multiple dimensions in the same place on the drawing. So maybe we wanted to then dimension uh, the distance between these two edges here and we had 100. That would generate a problem if we've already put the 80 there and we've got the 100 going over it. So we're crossing over the projection and the dimension lines now and this is generally something to be avoided. So you need to think carefully and because we're working in CAD most of the time you'll have the opportunity to move these dimensions around. Uh, so that you can make them look neater and so that they're nested nicely. So typically we want the smaller dimensions to be closer to the view and the bigger dimensions further away to avoid having them cross over. So something like that would be much preferable. So now let's 
take those dimensions and leave them there and look at how we go about dimensioning some of the other features on this drawing. We sometimes have an issue when we have small gaps and we can't fit the arrowheads and the numbers uh, between our projection lines and in cases like this it's acceptable to have the arrows pointing inwards towards each other and to not have the dimension line at all and to put the unit or the number of our dimension on the outside. So this is something that we might do like in this example. Here's another example where we've dimensioned the hole. The symbol here with the circle with the line through it represents uh, a, di a diameter. And so that's the shorthand we use to represent a circular diameter. And in this case, uh, due to the size of it and due to the other features here which might get in the way of our dimension, we've put it here with the arrows pointed in and some projection lines showing which hole it relates to. Here's another option which is also acceptable, having the arrows on the outside of the diameter and having the actual measurement on the inside of the circle, that's an option that we can utilise. We can also dimension circles with radial leaders. And so an example of that looks something like this. So we have a single arrow, arrow coming to point at the circle that we're interested in, and then we have our dimension standing off some distance away. When we come to dimensioning radii, uh, they need to be dimensioned with radii leaders. So here's an example of a radii on the inside of this corner here. That's a radius of 15 and R is a shorthand we use to denote radii. Here's another way that we could do it with the dimension over the top of the object. And yet another way here. So when you're using leaders, try to come off at an angle and then square them up with a nice flat bit before you have the dimension off to one side of them. There is a convention for when you use a radius dimension versus when you use a diameter dimension. You're, a, you're supposed to use a radius in uh, where you have half of a circle or less. So 180 degrees or less you should dimension with a radius. Any more than 180 degrees then you should dimension with a diameter symbol. It always makes your drawing a lot neater if you can align your dimensions wherever possible. So if we had to dimension this 30 millimeters up here and we have the space to it, it makes sense to have it in line with this 100 millimeter dimension here so everything looks nice and neat and you can see where each starts and stops rather than having um, them staggered up and down which can look messy so given the opportunity please try and align your dimensions wherever you can. Angles and chamfers so there's specific ways that we are supposed to dimension angles and chamfers according to the standards so here is one way to dimension an angle here where we don't have a face um, to refer to we have a projection line standing off from the object like it usually does and in this case where we've got a small angle we've got our arrows on the outside and there's usually a tiny little bit of an arc on them that you can add and then we have our dimension measurement here uh, typically in degrees standing off to the side. In terms of chamfers and a chamfer is an angled cut a small angled cut like this uh, commonly uh, equal equal length or equal angle then again we have a dimension so 8 is the the dimensional distance here that these arrows refer to and then 45 degrees is the angle uh, that this chamfer is actually cut on so let's take a look now at how we dimension and represent the threads we've already learnt how to draw the thread and that's with um, the inside of the, th the tip of the thread should be the hard line and then the type B line broken around the outside is the root of our thread and how we go about dimensioning that is as follows. So it's like a normal dimension we have an arrow and our leader coming off um, the feature and what this means M20 by 2.5 is basically the M in front of a number when you're referring to a thread refers to a metric. It's like a standard type thread in metric sizes. So it's a metric V thread of 20 millimeters diameter. And in this case, it has a two and a half millimeter pitch. 
you'll find that as you get into the bigger thread sizes, quite commonly there are different options of the pitch of the thread. So whether it's fine with a small thread or coarse with a much larger, chunkier thread. And so for these bigger sizes, it's common to actually put the pitch on the end. But for smaller sizes, um, we commonly leave that off and everybody just uses a common size. And these are listed in your blue book in the notes.